Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zinga Show. This is episode number 535 with I, your host, Agassino Zinga. This is episode number 535. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's the first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, specifically the or specifically the, pod, the Spotify app, they've now got a rating system on there. So if you can leave me a rating on there, that'd be really appreciated. But you can also do it on the Apple Podcast app. Five, four, three, two, one rating doesn't matter which one it is. Just do some kind of rating and get your boy up and down that chart, up and down the algorithm, and let it spread. And of course, support via patrons. Welcome to it. another patron episode is coming out at the end of this week. So if you're looking out for that one check out the patron at the end of this week for a bonus episode coming out for you live and direct very very soon and um, but apart from that great to have you back here once again great to have you back here once again um we've survived it's now the what the fourth day of um the new year i'm recording this on a tuesday so you know if you're still here still hanging on thank you know whatever god you do believe in because not every day is promised so that's a good thing going forward um apart from that the year has started off just as it kind of ended, isn't it? It just feels a bit dreary. It feels like the years kind of blend into one. Um, we're slowly but surely approaching three years living under some sort of COVID malaise. Um, most of us have just either decided we're going to ignore it and continue our life as per, as per usual. Some of us have decided that it's the scourge that's going to take us all down and we're kind of obsessed obsessively checking news and checking feeds and talking to people about stuff and we just can't get enough of it and some of us are just pretending it does not exist simply just pretending it does not exist and i appreciate every single stance because whatever gets you up in the morning whatever gets you going is what gets you going i don't necessarily think it's a bad way to approach it i just think it is what it is it's just a sad situation to be in overall because you would have expected considering where we are now considering the data points we have the information we have the experience that we have that would be a little bit more optimistic about the future but it doesn't feel that way even if this omicron variant doesn't seem to be as deadly it still seems people are worried in general i don't think anyone wants to get sick on purpose i don't think anyone wants to end up even if you're an anti-vaxxer you don't want to end up on that flipping herman cain subreddit right where they essentially give you um ironic awards for basically being somebody that denies the threat of the virus and then ends up passing away no one wants that so i don't think anyone wants to get sick so i guess people are just wary and just kind of you know skeptical oh no m mostly wary mostly wary and just trying to keep their head on the swivel so they can ensure that they're not in a situation where they do end up in a position where somehow that sort of thing's going to happen in the future and you don't want that so i definitely definitely get it um and that kind of leads us onto the future right how can you really plan for the future if you have no idea what the world's going to look like in a few months i say plan it anyway and i say just leave it up to the universe like um i think i've mentioned it to a couple of people no i think i saw a post actually on the subreddit somewhere talking about some festival happening in like august or september and talking about hotels i was like look or no i think someone said on there like hey man like you know don't worry about all that stuff and if you are going to book it make sure you book it with some level of insurance or some level of like refund guarantee like i know some places offer like half of a refund if you know maybe the event didn't go off or didn't happen or whatever maybe or the country's locked down or 60 percent or some sort of percentage depending on how soon you cancel it but put something in place that you can you know be able to extract some money out from it or if you're able and you've got the funds think of it as just like a think of it as like a lottery think of it as like a you playing yeah you playing a raffle and hoping you kind of you know your number gets drawn so if the country isn't on fire you can go to your event if it is on fire at least you have something to look forward to up until that date that kind of pulled you through the rest of the year um i think that's basically the most way to get about it i don't think you should be defeated I don't think you should give up. I don't think you should just stay, oh, I'm not going to book things. I'm just going to stay home and not do anything. Nah, enjoy yourself. You know, dream, live a little. If not, what's the point of living? But also, don't kind of go into it naively thinking, you know, the world's going to be exactly how you want it to be in pre-2019 times because it clearly isn't. But again, we can't let it defeat us. We can't let it grind us down. We kind of just have to learn to kind of operate it, operate within it as is. And that's kind of always been my kind of guiding principle in life, right? To kind of just exist in the world and to operate within it as it is and not as I want it to be. Because that's, in my opinion, that's a form of delusion. Like wanting the world to be exactly how you want it to be. Do you know what I mean? Just operate within it how it is. There's monsters, there's viruses, there's corrupt people, there's evil people. There's, you know, people with bad intentions, two-faced people, whatever it may be. They all exist in the world. Sometimes there's bad luck. But I'm going to do what I can do in my own 
um, with, with the things I have in my own control and then hope for the best when it comes to things that are outside of my control or pray or whatever it may be. That's the most we can do nowadays going forward. And I hope um, you all can kind of draw some strength from those kind of positions or those kind of ideas or that kind of philosophy or that kind of way of thinking. If not, then I don't necessarily see how you're going to get through the rest of the year because I have a feeling it's going to get really rocky, really bumpy sometime soon. But again, if you're able to kind of hold on to some something then hopefully that should um guide you through fingers crossed but yeah we got jump pack show to for you today more i have for you today loads of things to talk about loads of things to get through so as per usual grab yourself a drink whatever you need get yourself settled down and let's just dive on deep first things first to get out of the way and something i kind of went to highlight before and i didn't really want to highlight on the show because i kind of went to stay away from talking about football stuff because it drives me mental having to support united going through whatever we're going through now at the moment and seeing what our rivals are doing in the league and then seeing what the clubs are doing outside the top six it's quite scary to see how we might where we might be in a few years if we don't get our act right especially considering the amount of player power we seem to have at this club now it's just getting ridiculous right so um as most of you guys know we lost one nil to wolves at home the other day um a fairly standard performance from united this season despite our change in manager things don't really seem to change um the players st still stink up the place the fans still have delusions of grandeur about certain players um our people at the club can't seem to see what the issue is and we just keep going around and around in circles until i don't know when it's going to end maybe we're going to have to drop out of the top four for consecutive seasons maybe that might be a lesson we might learn maybe it might be more humiliating results i don't know what lesson needs to be had in order for us to collectively wake up but i still think there are sections of the fan base that really do think if we sign declan rice and you know harlan that suddenly we're going to be challenging for the title and i still think there are people at the club who generally think the players there are good enough to challenge for the title so there's too much but there's too um the variance in terms of opinion of where we should go and how we're heading as a club it's just too there's too many differences for us to have any kind of collective opinion to kind of pull us forward so that kind of obviously doesn't help um but performances wise that's been the most worrying thing i think about united's play um i think wolves even at even away even at home especially when you're playing them away it's always gonna be a difficult game they're notoriously hard to break down they don't concede a lot of goals um, they tend to have really decent players in attack and in midfield who can punish and hurt you even though they don't score a lot of goals they can always hurt you in different sort of ways from set pieces um, you know passing the pass quick passing football um, counter attacking they have different kind of weapons at their arsenal even though again they have quite a small group of players to kind of pull from in terms of seniority but they're fairly fairly dangerous so it's never an easy game but in terms of performance, again, like I said, performances, because I don't think this is a game that United fans would have expected to win hands down because, again, Wolves are a tricky side to face. But the performance of the team was just so bad that it kind of makes you wonder what goes on in training, whether or not the coach that we have in at the moment, Raf Ragnick, is actually being listened to. Um, whether he's having to play players because of their media branding sponsorship in you know um, commitments um, or whether the players that we have in general are just severely overrated and this is their level like he can only do so much I don't know what it is maybe it's a combination of all those things above but this performance was so bafflingly bad that it kind of beckers belief like I get like you know I don't know how many chances we created we must have created m maybe maybe less than five I think let's look at the stats actually on this on this google thing it's got the line of it. What the stats say? The stats say they had. <laughs> oh my god! The stats say they had nineteen shots, wolves, and we had nine, and they had six on target, and we had two, which kind of speaks to the overall shocking nature of the game. And I think only in the second half we kind of maybe got a foot on the ball more, which is why the possession stats were a bit better in our favour overall in the game. But if I remember correctly, the first half possession stats were mostly in wolves' favour, so they came to United dominate possession, which is you know I think sometimes when you're facing teams like that at home you could be forgiven for like allowing them to have a couple of chances because you're always attacking and you're leaving open space at the back and a hit on the counter. But when they proper have possession of the ball, I think again, in the first half, they're 60% to our 40. It makes you, it leads to, it kind of, leads you to understand that they are dominating every aspect of the game and maybe the way we set up to kind of played into their hands 
we had the classic Ralph Ragnick 4222 formation and obviously um Wolves played with a with a 3-4-3 formation which kind of essentially overloaded the midfield and also allowed them to have the space on the width to kind of um overlap with their fullbacks and the likes of um sorry Semedo and Marcao were just having running riot down the right and the left even even says had a bit of joy down there too so they were really getting a lot of joy for down our whips and again maybe we played into their hands because of our formation but i still think with the amount of training these guys have done so far it's not been a lot again i think you know covid has definitely hurt things and postponements but i don't think that's a good excuse because every team has had to deal with something no one's had a perfect couple of weeks to be drilling down things and put things into place everyone's kind of struggled but i still think we should see more of ralph's football now than we actually seeing we're not seeing enough of it and we're not seeing what i think the more concerning thing it looks like we're not seeing to use a dsp analogy or a dsp phrase it doesn't look like we're seeing a much buy-in from the players it doesn't seem that the players really believe in what he's trying to do um they tend to just try to do what he wants and then it feels like they just revert back to type when it doesn't go right because they just don't know any if anything else so i don't know whether or not that's just a personality thing that we just unluckily have a group of players who are s severely overplayed which kind of inflated their ego and made them believe they're better than what they are or whether it's just we're just unlucky and the players are just limited in their iq in, it, in their footballing intelligence and this is just what they can do they can't do anything more than this and you have to wonder when it comes to these sort of systems whether or not they are more suited to players who are maybe younger, more of a point to prove, um, maybe players who have played under the system for many, many years, because I don't know how much you can really teach a player like a Bruno Fernandes to play in this role. If all his life he's played as a conventional number 10, the way he's played a number 10, it's not really, I don't really, see, you know what I mean? Like, like Bruno Fernandes does that thing where he spams crosses, right? Or where he does that quick release kind of pass around the corner because he's not really good at kind of retaining the ball under pressure or dribbling. Yeah, that's just his thing what he has to do. Again, I'm so I'm not a fan of his, he's not my perfect number ten, but that's what he does as a player. It's very difficult to expect a player like that to then to go to like a team like a Man City or whatever, where you need to be on the ball, you need to be comfortable on the ball, receiving in tight spaces and play that kind of short passing game. It's really difficult for, it to, for him to expect to play like a Gundogan when he plays like Bruno Fernandes, especially at his age. So maybe that's that says maybe that's why most of these kind of coaches like Ragnick um, like the clubs and stuff when they come into these clubs it's really important it's less important about who they sign and more important about who they let go because once they get let go of the players who are unwilling to learn or incapable of learning it then opens up space for the kids to come in or for players who have a point to prove to learn those things in order to play that's what basically happens isn't it? and i think because we have just too many players in some positions and not enough in others and just too many in general just hanging around right who who are clearly either disillusioned or want to leave i think of the pogbas the martials the lingards the van der beeks the matters the hendersons the baies right there's a few players there who clearly don't know what they want to do at the club and clearly aren't necessarily infused by what's going on it doesn't necessarily, I don't think, brief for a good working environment in training, right? When those players already want to leave, they're already disillusioned. They don't get the way of new playing that's kind of, that's kind of being enforced or being spoken about by the new coaching staff. Um, they don't see a way forward personally. They maybe have different views on how the club should go forward. I don't know, whatever it may be. I just think it doesn't lead to a good thing. And I think that's basically what we're seeing on the pitch. We're seeing all that confusion. And when we come against the Wolves who are well-drilled, well-organized, who have played together for many years under different managers, of course, but the core of that team has been together for a while. Um, they're very experienced. I think, what is it? Someone said, I think um, I heard Housen say, Neves, I think he's at 25, 26. He's already got like 200 games under his belt at that age, right? Playing top flight football. So these players are all very experienced. Um, have a lot of skill um, for them for for you to kind of compete against that especially with the formation we play with the formation that they play it just kind of played into their hands and they completely dominated us for the majority of the game had the better chances and deservedly went a go ahead and obviously won the game in the end the only kind of silver lining that can come from this is obviously Phil Jones performance um, I've been a big critic of Phil Jones I'll still maintain that he is a representation of everything that's wrong with United a player of his standing quote-unquote 
um, still being at the club after two and a half years of not playing, um, hasn't really given any indication that he wanted to leave the club to seek pastures new to play elsewhere. There was this other story that allegedly happened. I'm not sure if it's true or not, that when Rafa Varan was signed, he actually wanted a number four, which is kind of what he's known for in terms of wearing um, as a centre-back for United. And Phil Jones was un unwilling to give him the number four because he believed that he could play his way back into the club or play his way back into starting lineup, which obviously he did. Obviously, mostly due to injuries and whatnot in COVID. But I just think somebody with that kind, a player that's so ordinary i think of that level having that ego again speaks for the general um unprofessional nature of the club and just the unserious nature of the club right we're not really trying to become the best club in the world we just are a media company or a media corporation that happens to have play football that's essentially what we're doing. we're just living off the success of our glory years from beforehand with alex ferguson in charge and we're just kind of riding that until we can ride it no more but there's no real intention i feel like or desire from the people above from the players from the whatever to get us back to where we need to be on that perch right back up to the top it doesn't exist because we don't move like that kind of club because i feel jones wouldn't still be at the club if that was the case you play a youngster there but he did he played and considering that he's been out for two and a half years he showed the kind of heart and courage and you know game readiness that you'd need for a player playing at man united i think he played with a point to prove and he clearly did do that maybe you could t say he had one mishap which kind of led to the goal but again i wouldn't be too fair to blame him on that again even i'm not a fan of his i think he did really well he was head and shoulders above everybody i think there's a picture going around on social media of him kind of jumping up and down before the game getting psyched up and everyone else is looking glum and it kind of speaks you know it speaks volumes for the whole overall nature of the club but there needs to also be had asked some questions about what Ralph Ragnick is doing um, with this midfield, with this formation, with the players available. Um, it doesn't seem like certain players are judged the same way as others. Certain players get away with absolute murder. It took a while for Rashford to get dropped. It took a while for Bruno to get dropped, even though they're playing poorly. We still haven't seen Van der Beek start a game. I think if I'm not mistaken, Phil Jones started a game in the league before Van der Beek has, despite Ralph Ragnick coming in saying he'd get a chance to play, despite him saying he doesn't want him to leave. I just don't get the, Va the, the Van der Beek thing. The Van der Beek thing, I rate him. I don't think there's any midfielder in that team who could definitely say they're better than him overall. I don't think they exist, personally. If you don't rate Van der Beek, it's fine as a main fan but I don't think you can honestly say that McTominay, Matic or Fred are that much better than him so if that's the case and they keep playing why can't he play also because it's not as if those guys are shit and then he doesn't play them no he still plays them because there's only ones available but for some whatever reason he doesn't trust Van der Beek to play in that position or to even replace um, Bruno Fernandes because if I'm not mistaken when Bruno Fernandes was off or was out injured or suspended he replaced him with Greenwood or Sancho or somebody right? it wasn't even Van der Beek that got to play which is bizarre you'd imagine that Van der Beek would accompany or would complement a Sancho more in that midfield more than a Greenwood because Greenwood essentially is a striker he's not a midfielder I think this idea that Greenwood is Foden is the main adverse of Foden has been kind of put to bed now because we clearly see he can't play that position. He's better up front as a centre forward. But again, because of seniority and because of the brand and because of the money spent and because of the names in terms of Cavani and Ronaldo, Greenwood is probably never going to play up front for United again unless those two, one or two of those guys gets injured. And that's what happened when Cavani was out. When Cavani was out, Greenwood played alongside Ronaldo. As soon as Cavani comes back in again, he's not going to play up front again. So that's obviously a big problem. But next question needs to be asked about Raf Ragnick in terms of his ability to identify who the actual good football players are in the club. I still don't get the whole Martial thing. I think even if he wants to leave, I think you still play him because he's clearly in this system or in the players we have available, how you want to play football, he's clearly going to be a better complement to either Ronaldo or Cavani playing up front than either of them are going to be to each other because he's mobile, because he can play quick interchanging passes, he can come in off the left, he's not going to occupy the same space that Ronaldo or Cavani would occupy if they're through the middle. It just would work better. And I think if he does want to play for, play for a move, especially just considering the amount of services given to the club and the amount of big goals you scored, let him play for his move. I don't necessarily see what's wrong with that. I really don't get it. Like other clubs have done it with other players that want to leave. Why are we suddenly the club now that ice is out players because they want to go somewhere elsewhere? I don't really understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Especially if we're not getting a sign of a player. If we're not going to sign somebody, then anti Martial should play. That's basically what I'm saying. Same with the Van der Beek thing. If you don't rate Van der Beek, sell the guy and get someone else in that you can actually play because we need another option in midfield because at the moment, Matic, McTominay and Fred are not the answer, especially when they're in there together. We need someone to kind of mix it up and offer some sort of respite because at the moment, those two or those three can't 
pass consistently for an entire game to save their life they can't command the midfield they're not at the level of the top teams like neither of those guys are better than cover or on the same level as cover titch. so like what are we talking about even so those are major major concerns and i don't know man again worrying game overall i think united have a lot of problems we have a lot of issues i don't necessarily see them getting better before they get any worse I, i'm of the thinking maybe i'm in the minority here that we probably need to go down a level in terms of um not qualifying for the top four in order for us to wake up because i don't think we're a club that really learns our lesson based on successes we mostly learn lessons based on failures and even then we still take a long time to actually make a move or to make a decision um but i think if we if we fail to finish top four this season which is very likely considering the four of Arsenal, considering the form of West Ham, considering the form of Tottenham, um, those clubs are all, I think, playing way better than us with kind of less resources. Um, you would maybe say with better managers, maybe it's in the modern sense, I don't know, but still, those clubs I feel like are in a you know are in a good position to solidify that spot. If that's the case, it's going to be a good thing. If we drop down to Europa League or the Europa Conference League, that's going to be a good thing for the club. We need to have some level of wake up call because I don't think. Because I think most people will agree, elite positions are a great indicator of where you actually are. They actually display where you are as a club. There's no lying. There's no fobbing the numbers when it comes to the league table. You are where you 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 finish where you you deserve to finish in a the league. There's no kind of mucking about in that one. Um, but again, man, just a concerning place to be for a United fan. I don't see it getting better anytime soon. Um, there's loads of conflicting kind of information coming out at the club i think i saw recently a tweet going out allegedly some players feel disillusioned with ralph ragnick's flipping um way that he's managing the club and stuff i think i've actually got it up here actually let me get it up on there all of this stuff is like really concerning and really kind of um doesn't make any sense but if it was me I, i'd be willing to let go of every player that wants to leave and just start again with the kids and whatever's left Whoever veteran, whoever senior players left, whoever's left after the fact, just play them and the kids until the end of the season. Because we're going to get a new manager in anyway at the end of the, at the, end of the year, supposedly, right? Um, another manager is going to come in because Ralph is an interim because he's going to be consulting about it. If that's the case, just start from scratch. Let all those players leave so you can actually have the ability to actually coach these players into some semblance of a coachable side so that the new manager comes in has something to build from because at this point i don't see what they have to build from seeing them they just got names they don't have players that can actually play anywhere in football so obviously that's not good um what is it da, 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 da. let's see here oh my god look at this absolutely terrible our club in it so supposedly this is the news coming out from um united right so the first bit of news of course is there's a good chance that one matter will stay united until the summer which is obvious because you know united don't let go of players for some reason um even if there's surplus to requirements whenever a player wants to go it's like we remember they're alive oh no no we want to keep it actually we want to keep it because of our numbers they don't actually want to keep them because of they want to play them or because they see that they're going to make any sort of difference to the overall side and i don't get it if i'm at a surplus to requirements and you don't want him at the club let the guy leave and seek partials new but they don't we keep him at the club he's going to get you know he's probably going to get another contract renewal going to keep paying the money and then by the time it comes from to leave we're not going to be able to get the transfer fee we want and then we're going to be disappointed it's like you you make a rod for your own back in that one it says here um a source uh close to the squad claiming as many of 11 players now want to leave after becoming disillusioned with life at united which is understandable considering the circumstances they want to go let them leave again like i said i think the players are clearly the virus at the club i think what um what Mourinho said about paul pogba a few years ago that he was the virus i think was kind of right but i don't think it's just only him i think it's the players overall um i think at that time as well that was when he kind of lost the battle with anthony marshall he wanted to sell him and i think anthony marshall was basically what was it richard arnold's or somebody in the club higher up's favorite player so obviously they kind of kabush that move but that kind of goes to show you the, the kind of influence and the power these players have at the club considering they've done not much they're not really one big honors and stuff right and they're not really consistent performers at the club for them to have the ability to dictate what managers can sell what they can buy if, if they get sacked or not it's just disgusting really um it says here many of the players are overwhelmed sorry underwhelmed by Ragnick's coaching and not impressed by the tactics and disappointed by the lack quality of his system so they were disappointed or no they didn't make a they didn't kick up a stink when Solskjaer was thinking no they didn't kick up a stink in the first couple of years of Solskjaer but then when it started to go wrong for him the same guy that is allegedly all supported and respected they all started leaking news about him to the press 
they were all bewildered at his level of coaching. But then now another guy comes in who's meant to be the grandfather and the mentor for people like, you know, Tuchel, um, you know, um, Klopp and Nagelsmann and stuff. Now suddenly this guy isn't good enough for these same players who have won nothing in the game or who are basically playing really shift. Forget won nothing. Maybe you could argue against that because some of them have trophies. But for the most part, these players have been mediocre for this club for many, many years. More, more years probably than managers that we've hired have been unsuccessful, right? Those managers have probably won more trophies as managers themselves than the club have vis-a-vis. -vis. Do you know what I mean? That sort of thing. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, unless the players here, Jesse Lingard, Donny van der Beek, Eric Bailly, Donny Henderson, are among those players who have become frustrated at their failure to give the chance on the ragging, which is true. The chance thing is a big deal. Jesse Lingard, for sure, he can kind of blame himself kind of partially because he was obviously, he had a very successful loan at West Ham last season. Um, he clearly wanted to stay there. I think he probably would have preferred to stay there. United then goes to Ronaldo, who's his idol. He then gets told by Oli that he wants to be part of the team again. He thinks he's going to make a contribution. And of course, I think Lingard never really went to leave United anyway because he loves the club. Um, he then stays because he wants to play with his idol and because he's given assurances by Oli that he has to play. He's going to play. He doesn't play at all. And I think most of it has to do with the spanking that we got from flipping, you know, um, Man City probably played into it. Also, Liverpool and stuff, maybe that played into it. I don't know, in terms of all the decision making. But he doesn't play it and now he's basically on the bench, rotting away during his peak years. Donny van der Beek, the same sort of thing. He probably should have seen the the writing was on the wall a long time ago and left under Oli's tenure. But again, he was sold a dream by the club that he'd get a chance to impress, he'd get a chance to regain his spot in the team. It didn't happen under Oli, but then he was given assurances under Ralph it would happen, and it still hasn't happened. Phil Jones started ahead of him. And Eric Bailly is the same thing. He can't really have any complaints because he signed the contract knowing full well that Mike, Harry Maguire is one of our centre-backs, and maybe there was rumours that we are going to sign another one. So if that was the case, we were never going to sign an understudy. We were never going to sign a starter. So the fact that he would re-sign a new contract at the club knowing that he's not going to play week week out because Harry Maguire is always going to play because he's an England captain. So because he's a club captain, was dumb. Dean Henderson, the same thing, was sold a dream. Like all these players have kind of valid criticism as to why they would want to leave now and why maybe they were didn't leave beforehand because you know the criticism, sorry, the the guarantees they got from the club were a bit um manipulative in their nature right um it says here another one clicks are understood to have formed within the united squad with interim boss ralph ragnick facing many of the same problems that forced the second of uh, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. an increased number of players margin marginalized on the social are suffering the same treatment under ragnick which also led divisions within the united dressing room of course and that's what i've always said like Oli, this whole thing about his rebuild cultural reset is bullshit because he's left a pretty toxic dressing room for the next manager to come and pick up and the same dressing room that he was kind of lording over and saying he's got great players were the same ones that essentially got him the sack anyway because they're down tools and then now the same people who are suddenly turning around and trying to tell us that ralph ragnick's a problem he might be the issue he might be a bit of a dinosaur he might have been past his best he might be more of a better person to run the club upstairs than to be running the club from the dugout cool let's say that's true but so far no manager has been able to get the best out of these players over the years and we're starting to think now most of these fans should accept the fact that this is definitely an issue with the players these players are definitely the virus they're definitely the players who have kind of held the club back all these years and we need to get them out sooner rather than later um Continues here said the source says it's not good, the atmosphere is really bad and it looks like there are going to be a big problems ahead of for United. Of course, Ronaldo, um, there's frustration in some players about the influence of Christian Ronaldo holds of international teammates and other Portuguese-speaking players. Harry Maguire, Sun Cavani, and Mason Greer, I believe, to have found unsub undroppable presence of Christian Ronaldo have challenged to their expected roles. What? Harry Maguire doesn't. Harry Maguire clearly has an issue. The fact that Ronaldo is more of a senior player, and obviously should have the armband then more so than him. And Harry Maguire should never have had the armband at United because I think it's definitely been a um, a burden for him. I don't think he's performed well overall as a captain. I don't think his status and his stature as a player deserves that armband in the first place, especially considering the amount of relegations he had to suffer the clubs he's been at, and considering the fact that he's grossly over over overvalued in terms of his transfer fee, which has definitely affected his perception as a player, because I think if we were to sign him for 50 million, 30 million, it would have been a different story. But the fact that he was signed as 80 million off the back of a Virgil van Dijk signing that went to Liverpool, you can't help but compare the both of them and clearly one player is better than the other, right? Even though Virgil van Dijk isn't fucking, you know, Cannavaro or anything, there's a real big difference in class and skill and ability and, you know, uh, presence and leadership. It's just miles and miles apart. Um, I just don't get any of it. I really don't. And some people expected the Ronaldo thing to be 
to be this situation where essentially you're bringing back a legend of his ilk he's going to ruffle some feathers and I just don't I just don't get it from Ronaldo's side I don't get it I think for Ronaldo you're coming to back to his club you're coming back to a mess he probably would have been better off going to Man City you would have been a plug and play he would have been sitting in the box or standing in the box and just tapping goals in for fun right it would have been an easy job for him to kind of just tap the goals in and continue going it would have, it would have hurt as United fans to see him in the Manchester City blue but as a player he wouldn't have had to work as hard as he's doing now at the moment running chasing you know keeping balls in the in the, in play and then having Aaron, Aaron Romasaka just kick them out because he mistakenly kicked the ball he's left foot first before hitting his right like it just wouldn't it's just so much trouble for somebody of his kind of standing it doesn't really make any sense but again maybe the money was just too good to turn down and I think basically that's most the update but yeah United's in shambles we're not going to get any better anytime soon it's going to get worse before it gets better it's probably going to get brutally bad before it gets better and you just gotta strap yourselves in me personally i've decided i'm not watching any more games i'm done i think this club has kind of used up any more of my free time that i don't need to use committing myself to like what two hours for the match another three hours for the post-match analysis on twitter spaces youtube channels you know twitch and shit i'm just watching so much content regarding my team after the back of a loss so i'm not gonna do it i'm really not i'm done until the end of the season um or done until we get a new manager or whatever i'm just done i'm just done for the season i'm over it um i'm waiting to a new new season hopefully we get rid of all these players that don't want to leave in january some around this time so we can kind of clean shop and maybe brighten up the atmosphere somewhat in the dressing room because we need some level of change because this is getting too much now man this is honestly getting too much but you know maybe i'm in the wrong there i don't really know what can we do here um, again, moving on from that one because all the football talk is annoying and depressing. This is news courtesy of BBC. It says these two guys, I'm sure most of you have seen on social media before, have unfortunately passed away due to COVID. It says the Francis Bogdanov TV twins die of COVID six days apart, which is weird, isn't it? It's happened. I guess it happens a lot with twins. It happens a lot with older couples who have been married for a long, long time. There is something that happens. I think what is it called? I forgot the the term of it is called, but it's basically like dying from a broken heart sort of thing when you have a connection with somebody so deep so visceral that when they're no longer around for whatever reason your body seems to react and then you end up passing away not many days later after the fact i think it happens a lot like i said with older couples but obviously these guys were you know a little bit naive and dumb in that they didn't get the vaccine and unfortunately they died you know um what you call it they died uh they died uh, an avoidable death because they didn't want to get the vaccine which is obviously disappointing it says here um Grika and igor bogdanov became france's most famous twins um hosting a tv science and science fiction show in the 1980s on a spaceship set they died of coronavirus within days of each other in the hospital Grika on 20th of december his brother on monday age 72 the brothers have not been vaccinated against covid 19. the friends said that they were convinced a healthy lifestyle would protect them and they would admit to the hospital in mid-december although the families not specified the cause of death their lawyer edward um deb lamaz confirmed that they both contracted the virus and it's something i've been wondering a lot about when it comes to these alternative medicines and people i don't i guess it's one thing if you're going to do alternative meds to kind of con, con, protect yourself from covid if you're young i think it makes more sense even if you're the fit i think it makes sense if you're young even if you're not you know you're not physically fit but if you're young it makes more sense younger than what they were 72 is probably too old it makes a lot more sense to kind of maybe look at different options especially if you're athletic especially if you're doing sports i understand the hesitancy right especially if you're seeing people get the vaccine and somehow their respiratory system suffers or whatever i don't know whatever but if you're 72 surely you got to do yourself a favor by increasing your chance to stay alive by just getting the vaccine it's not going to be foolproof it's not going to be 100 percent preventative in terms of death but it's going to help you somewhat you would imagine so um the only thing i can think of is a contract would be like maybe they just didn't care maybe they generally thought you know there is because that's something as well i've always been wondering too when it comes to covid it seems like in the west we have this obsession or this desire to somehow save everybody and we're not even up with our best intentions, there's never going to be a time where we can 100% save every single person, um, you know, out there in the world. Some people might contract COVID, just be unlucky, get it, and then just pass away fairly soon after the fact, right? It just is part of life. It is what it is. Um, if that's the case, if that's the case, we have to accept there will be some deaths. And I think people maybe have to be a bit more mature about COVID and just, you know, be aware that, you know, 
there's no guarantees that you won't get it. But if you do get it, there's also no guarantees that you're going to stay alive. And I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Um, I don't necessarily think the preservation of all life at all times should be the forefront thing in everybody's mind. Do you know what I mean, sometimes people pass away for the most bullshit of reasons, not even to do with anything to do with COVID. So imagine that. Imagine passing away with those kind of things on the back of your head. That's not even a good thing. So I, just, I, I don't know. I just think people have dealt with this thing really, really weirdly. I think, again, if you're a celebrity and you have money, you have wealth, and you have people that you look after, which I'm sure these guys do, you probably owe it to them to just get vaccinated so you can make sure people can keep their kids in school and shit and whatnot. But some people just generally don't give a F probably. Um, da -da -da, it says the family friend Pierre Jean Calor, not was that Calicon? Calencon said that they had left it too late to sneak to seek hospital treatment, deciding it was similar to flu. Jesus Christ. People who said that they were anti vaxxers, but they probably absolutely was not. So if you say it's similar to flu being anti vax, okay. Several friends told them to get themselves vaccinated, but they felt because of their lifestyle, their lack of accountability. Uh, comorbidity they weren't at risk okay they're like of okay cool being sedentary i guess um the bogdanov brothers were a pair of eccentrics described so descendant from the austrian nobility fetid for their in, in initially saturday afternoon tv morning temps which ran from 1979 they were still known as for years for popular science and were part of the public life in the rest of their lives the program on tf1 was for years seen in some ways as a highlight of kindness technology according to Lemod. temps x co based um uh, other shows including doctor who and prisoners of star trek with guests including electronic music promoter jean-michel jarre they look so handsome before they absolutely butchered their faces in it but to be fair to them too this isn't their fault this is like this is like a what this is like a pre-social media um, passive surgery, right? They got the, they got their surgeries done like back when, you know, it wasn't that great. The standards weren't that good. You know, the surgeons weren't as good as they are nowadays because the, this is a proper throwback look at it. It's like a Donna Sala Versace sort of pro, pro, um, plastic, um, plastic surgery job. Um, however, when the TV channel went private in 1987, they were dropped. During the 1990s, their facial features changed dramatically, leaving them with the odd-looking chins, lips, and cheekbones. We are proud of having faces like extreme extraterrestrials, they once said. Cricket Birdoff once said was adamant that they had never had what we call a cosmetic surgery, insisting that he and his brother were experimenting um, bent by nature and tried to very advanced technology. So they didn't... So people have been... Yeah, this kind of... um lack of the mission when you get work done is something that's always puzzled me i guess i guess it's no one's prop i guess it's no one's business anyway what you do with your face and body but this whole complete denial that you didn't get anything done and that is some other thing it's just like what like oh it's just nice i've just been doing squats i've just been doing this i've been doing that yeah you sure you have but yeah um they were anti-vax they passed away because you know they weren't responsible now their family mourns their death now people on the social media are going to be clowning them what a crappy way to go out in it doesn't make any sense but you know some people are just not really born with all the senses unfortunately not born with all the senses um next on the list here uh duh, 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 duh. oh yeah we have an article quickly talking about the blackberries again i think i mentioned in the previous podcast obviously they're going to turn off um blackberry services i think today or tomorrow um so after the fact you won't be able to use most of the features that you know and love with blackberries and even sometimes i think phone and messages too so essentially turn the entire phone into a complete brick but i was kind of um gushing over how influential how important having a blackberry was back in the day when i was younger and obviously having the ability to have a full quasi keyboard the ability to kind of text your friends on a fly like that text on iMessenger like that and it was just a fun time it really, really was a fun time um but unfortunately it was short-lived for whatever reason and um now we're left with the space where most phones look like iphones none of the phones look like basically a blackberry look and i think if anything a blackberry nowadays would be the most important sort of tool especially one that just did the basics just let you browse the internet check your email golf and you know or whatever um, you know uh talk on the phone and send messages that would be pretty decent i think it really really would but unfortunately you know each of our phones has turned into a kind of mini flipping tablet or whatever it may be and then we have this article here courtesy of bbc it says five things you definitely heard um if you had a blackberry phone 
Wash your pin, you remember that? Get an old school picture of Kim Kardashian holding one. Um, Blackberry Messenger, fondly known as BBM, was the only cool way to keep in touch with your friends. It was used to everything from general chat to sharing real vi- sorry, viral stories. Before the days of adding each other on Snapchat or Instagram, we had it, all you needed sorry, was a BBM pin. Eight days long, so eight digits long, it was the key to chatting up everyone who fancied. If you hadn't given one your pin so much in person, you might be asking a friend who hadn't brought us a pin. It, would, it also hadn't duh, 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 duh. Uh, ping it. I don't know myself. What's ping? Oh, I'm actually free to that one. What's ping? Um, now, when people don't reply to your messages, you might just wish them. You might wish you had BBM's ping feature. Uh, there was a nothing quite like a satisfying and spamming your friend with messages reading ping, making them phone buzz uncontrollably. Ping wasn't only used to prompt someone to apply to it, it was also part of the once iconic BBM activity, sorry, um, a activity, BBM activities. What, what can I read it? Um, rates, was, um, rates was a game. So the address could skip that. Screen muncher, I don't remember. Screen muncher, no replies, not in the mood. What was that one? BBM was not like uh was unlike the carefully curated fees on Instagram or the millions of videos on TikTok. All you should show all you could show on there was your name, picture and your status. Remember when you were not out was when you were out with friends at your local shopping centre and you would add all their names on a BBM show that you were there to them. If your knees jogging, if Sophie was out there with mates Mia, Amelia, Jess and her BBM username might be something like Sophia da, 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 da. Um, there was also noticing some traumatic um, more than someone did yeah it's cool so yeah Blackberry BBMs are gone Blackberries are gone for good it would be good to see some level of kind of competition when it comes to iPhones and Androids and this kind of classic silhouette of an iPhone right it'd be good to see some level of change because I'm a little bit bored of it I have to be honest I think um, Apple still do a good job in terms of drumming up some level of interest and intrigue around the releases of these new phones, but they don't necessarily look that new. The most newest thing you see from them is how they kind of uh, put together the camera, right, and the lenses and how that's organized and whatnot. But in terms of form factor, it's all the same. Nothing really changes if you think about it, and it's a bit annoying. Let's be honest, it's a bit annoying to see. With a full technology, would be um, far more down, a kind of more prosperous and open-minded view than that. But, you know, I guess not. <laughs> then on the other side of things, we have this news courtesy of BBC regarding Elizabeth Holmes, the former founder of Theranos, who's obviously in trouble, was obviously on trial recently for scamming and swindling investors out of millions, if not billions, of dollars. Um, it was interesting to see people. There's a clip going around now of um, someone shouting at her his mom, her mom or something, or at her or something. It's a bit lame overall. Um, I'm of again a similar ilk to some people have said, as you know, as a uh, heinous as she has been as a person. Considering the time that's passed and whatnot, I don't know. Does she deserve to get double digits prison time? I'm not too sure. I guess the only thing that kind of sticks out to this is like who died off the back of kind of waiting for this fairness machine to be put together or to be you know sold or shipped to them, whatever it may be. Or maybe who died under the pressure. I think there's one dude in it, right? There's a founder or someone that worked with the company who essentially was gaslit by Elizabeth Holmes to the point where he felt he had to take his own life because I think he felt, you know, he felt a little bit conflicted that he was... um he felt, I think he felt a little bit conflicted that he was basically having to work for the company and lie um, about their results or lie about how well they're doing. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the wife is basically coming after Elizabeth Holman or her own civil suit, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe there you'd, you'd think she deserves some jail time. I don't know, man. These people are just... They're a different breed, isn't it? I don't necessarily see jail time is actually going to teach her any lessons. She might come out of it even more emboldened and willing to prove her quote-unquote doubt was wrong. But anyway, it sees the following. Silicon Valley's trial of the century. BBC News says it was a verdict that reflected the often painful complexities or contradictions of the blood testing company Theranos. Four guilty verdicts, four acquittals and three charges on which the jury couldn't agree. For many who had followed the Theranos saga, the podcast, the distant from to the documentaries, the books, you might have thought that Elizabeth Holmes' conviction was nailed down. After all, she had cleared her diagnostic machine, could test a, you know, first hundreds hundred diseases that weren't there um and she was the founder chief executive of fairness so surely the back 
would stop with her in the court. And that's the thing that the big thing that stuck there because the thing that kind of fucked her over in general, because her defense about her ex boyfriend or ex fiance, whoever that was, guy, right? One of the other, I think, investors of it, of the company, how about he was abusive and he bullied her and all this sort of stuff, doesn't really have weight or doesn't really hold any weight or isn't really believable because in every bit of media we saw Elizabeth Holmes in when she was running fair enough she was a strong badass kind of woman right kind of running this company in a man's world and kicking ass and you know shaking babies and whatnot so to suddenly go from that person to suddenly I was this meek affluent white woman that just kind of got intimidated by this immigrant dude that doesn't sell do you know what I mean that really doesn't sell she's trying to do it and it obviously did the, the jury didn't bite um but underestimate homes at your peril. This woman who created a nine billion equivalent to six point six billion company to she set up when she was nineteen. A woman who at one sorry at one point had the world at her feet, who Bill Clinton, Joe Biden can both praise. Crazy to see how she come in it. The videos of her just talking are the best though, because that fake voice is just epic. I really can't wait until she has a prison or a post prison interview and she drops the fake voice so we get to hear what she actually sounds like. That'd be hilarious. Um it's this year. There was another reason to think Holmes might be acquitted there are four cases um these four cases are extremely difficult to prosecute jurors are asked to consider hundreds of difficult technical documents and sit for evidence from dozens of witnesses yo this text is kicking my ass the same way ad reads kid brendan's in it i don't know what's going on with me today um holmes just said that i am just had a baby though and some comments believe that she would stare systematic sympathetically character she, she would what and con commentators believe that she would strike a sympathetic character um holmes was also personally given evidence and a usual thing to happen in a fraud case she described a relationship with a then foreign chief executive officer ramesh sunny balawani so i've mentioned before um who she claims uh exercised coercive control over her she also said that she might have been mutually so sexually abused mrs balani denies this accusation imagine you right you're you're the former girlfriend or former boyfriend or former boyfriend let's say of elizabeth holmes because obviously you work together and you build up some sort of relationship or kinship whatever it may be she gets in trouble for something that she clearly did on her own and you're somewhere else living your own life with your own family your own kids and she's suddenly throwing under the bus and your twitter your pings are going off the chain i wonder what that could feel like i really do um holmes was also personally giving evidence in the court an uh, unusual thing to do to, to, sorry continues here um but um i missed that bit here so, yeah, holmes defense was believed um also um, to, um's defense also believed that they had one killer argument that holmes ever sold her shares which was a bad argument really her defense argued that if she was a genuine fraud she would have taken the money and ran instead they said she believed that what she was doing or she just had enough money where it didn't matter because again we have to remember this elizabeth this dude you know elizabeth holmes woman doesn't come from a poor family made a bunch i think we've been speaking towards or whatnot maybe she just lived off that who knows but it doesn't necessarily give a good sign that she was not guilty to be honest that but hey it says here um you bet things can be true you can have a vision great and a mission as holmes would call it at the same time holmes was shown evidence that she herself admitted didn't look good she said on more than one occasion that there were things she would have done differently in hindsight one particular example that sticks out when the logic so when the logos of pfizer and the glasses scream glass stream that's what Smith Klein were used, sorry, to support the two pharmaceutical companies that had endorsed Theranos. They had done so in no such thing. The production prosecution made this massive, major leap in their argument as soon as they could to get a smoking gun. Yeah, man. And I've, <laughs> I've been there. I really have. I've worked for startups where they purposely fudge the numbers or the ones that are the best is where they make everything seem like it's automated but it's not we're the ones that automate to get in the background in the back end right whether it's like a payment platform a shipping platform an admin platform whatever we're the ones manually doing it but from the front it looks like somebody um when you're front facing on a website it looks like somebody's basically you know it's an automatic robot door thing just happens you know on its own it's like no no, no there's someone approving that shit and telling you guys to sit side by side or whatnot you know what i mean that's mad to think about right hey um homer's defense has also had a major hole in the air in it among everything you speak about for says that uh, homes run the company like an old obsessive autocrat she knew everything about it when she grew up so again that does worry this comment that she was just some dandelion who had no idea what was going on it says here yet part of her defense was built that she didn't know that there was a sorry that there was happening in her community or that major problems in this tech are all often she said that she wasn't aware of the information put in the company commentators 
but try their orders. Um, blah, blah, blah. Cool. <sighs> Again, all this effort just required, I don't know. Holmes always wanted to be in control and some in particular aid so she decided to testify to be in the driving seat of her own defense. It didn't work. But yeah, um, so send this thing soon. We're going to see what's going to happen. It probably does spell the end of the girl boss. It probably does spell the end in some way, shape or form of people deleting people on just the strength of what they say. They need to come back to a point in life where we kind of believe people of the strength of their character and how they act and how other people speak about them and the work they produce. Just, you know what I mean? That should be what we're about nowadays and less so on just, oh, these are heat, these are heat. No, no, no. Let's talk about what this person's like as an actual human being and maybe we can get some way. Whether or not this is going to change things, I don't think it has. I think there's a line here that says, um, um, da, 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 da. Um, but others would wonder whether it would change anything in the soon Silicon Valley and there are still major rewards um, for letting dreams, for letting investors, um, for telling investors what they think they want to hear rather than what they want to hear, which is true, um, definitely for sure. But I just think, I just think the, um, the risk, the, the reward far outweighs the risk when it comes to startups like if you can prove a proof of concept or you know you can ship your product and you know in a minimal viable form and then you can get it to raise some level of funding that far out reaches what you're actually currently worth which could then allow you to get more staff and expand your company and maybe get a new office space i don't see why you wouldn't lie like i said the rewards are just too outlandish for there not to be one that's the only concern I have with all of it. Um, and it looks like everyone's trying to become the next whatever, whatever it may be. And I think even the time that property management company I was working in was basically saying they want to be the disruptor of, Airbnb, of disruptive hotel similar to what Airbnb was. It's like, eh, okay, I guess so. Um, that didn't necessarily, you know, inspire confidence. But again, like I said, I think the rewards are just too great. People are always going to lie, especially if there's reward like this, because I think most people in a position, if they're smart or if she had allies, maybe she does get away with it. But, you know, you left a trail of dead bodies in your wake. Um, most likely, I think, you know, for sure, for sure, for sure, there's definitely somebody who passed away from complications based on the machine itself. Like, again, I mentioned there's one guy who passed away, unfortunately, because he took his own life off the back of the stress of working out there. And so maybe some other things going on in his life. So she's definitely got blood in her hands in some way, shape or form. But whether or not this deserves actual proper sit down jail time and that's going to change anything i have my doubts i really do have my doubts mm. this is a pretty mad one and this is courtesy of mix mag it says anger has met police share video of street side drug swabbing in shoreditch i don't know what this is meant to do i guess this is tied into what um what's her name um <sighs> I'm not going to do it again. Like I'm turning to DSP, joining into the microphone. Please forgive me. Um, it kind of reminds me of what, what his face does. Um, what Boris Johnson was talking about in terms of clamping down on drugs, right? Somehow it feels like, you know, there's been more conversation around clamping down or people using class A, class B drugs than it has been about people talking about that fucking picture of him sitting in the garden, right? But hey, we move in it. But I don't necessarily see what this video or this article no what this video basically does what does it do does it make people worried that they shouldn't go out to shoreditch and they avoid the clubs there which is again is going to clearly affect the club's bottom line and basically leave them without staff until what later on in the evening which is insane because you'd always see people walking around that's probably the impression in east london the trendy part of east london where people legitimately don't mind sitting outside and having a booze booze up do you know what i mean um whereas for us phew. anyway continues here it says here as follows um Social media users have started share their outreach at a video posted by Metropolitan Police depicting them conducting street side searches in London shortage. <laughs> the video was published on the Met Police's Twitter account and with the caption, Taxford officers were out recently doing drug swabs in shortage, a part of a, where a wider operation to ensure the nighttime economy is a safe place to be. The nighttime economy, you know, it could be argued or clubs in general, especially in London, aren't safe because people that go in there are fucking crazy and on drugs. I think they're mostly unsafe because there's not sensible opening hours, right? If people are all having to rush in between 2 or before 2 p.m. 2 and the person you want to see playing is playing at one forty-five, and then you've got all these wild lads in front of you not pushing in and, or just boys in general don't want to let in, it's not going to work. It really isn't. So I think that kind of whole cage thing was definitely a bit of a faux pas when it comes to... um 
when it comes to all this. It really, really was. Um, it continues anyway. Multiple judges, uh, and like I said, I just don't see the use of this. Like, what's this really going to do? Like, what are you searching for? Do you want these people not to go out? Um, you know, are you stopping them from going out, taking what they're taking, and arresting them on the spot fines? But again, what's on the spot fine, and how do you de de determine? You know, if Ket is worth more of a fine than Coke, or are they all in the same category? I don't know, but it does seem like a bit of a. It does seem like a super British thing to do. Pretty useless, you know. It's all good for the optics and shit, but considering how these police officers look, and considering if that was me in Shoreditch, like, there's no way, no, there's no way any of these guys are catching me. If they decide to come up and pull up next to me whilst I'm having a bump of Ket or something, I'm blitzing away, especially off the back of that. You know what I mean, you're, you're gonna feel like fucking Sonic running from these guys for sure. Let's quickly play the video of it. So it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, it looks like they're searching a lot of immigrants. I don't see a lot of, um, okay, I don't see a lot of Jack Deans or, you know, Danny Mar. I don't know, you know, these kind of cockney lads that always have, you know, they always say their names, their first name and their surname. I don't see a lot of those guys around in these videos, and those are mostly the guys that go around in Shoreditch, right? The alright mates, right? The skinny jeans and big bicep army. I don't see none of them getting swabbed. I just see bare immigrants, which again, telling 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 sign of where how we are or the life that we live in shoreditch and also maybe just stand outside shoreditch shoreditch house why don't you do that why do why are you going to the slums why are you going to all the little corners and shit why don't you just stand out of that affluent place where people have to pay a grand a year to be a member of this club why don't you just stand outside there and get people to swap their hands there you'd be in for a big surprise if you did Considering everything like <laughs> I understand that you need to do everything and you just can't stop, you know, policing because we're under COVID. But considering what's going on in this country, considering the amount of despair people are living under, people are still employed, people's families are broken, people's lost met family members, partners, close friends. Um, you know, we're probably going to come out of this into some sort of recession, right? The, like, considering all the issues that's, that's, that's at hand at the moment, is this really a good t use of their resources, of their resources, sorry, of their time when it comes to peace officers? Should they be really concentrating on such frivolous things or they should be focused on other things? Like, what is this? Like, literally, what is this? It makes completely no sense. Um, like I said, I think clubs or nightlife in London would be better served if they just left them open longer. If you could have more places open until 6, 7, 8 a.m., you probably would reduce the amount of people actually going out and doing hard drugs. I legitimately think so. Because people are generally going out mostly to kind of let their hair down and to escape the troubles of everyday life. But if they're able to go to clubs and just enjoy them as actual places to go and listen to good music and to go see per per people perform or to go connect with a community, maybe they wouldn't you know ramp them up as like these big deal things that oh i'm gonna go see this person play maybe it wouldn't be that big of a deal maybe you could just approach it like a gig and just go and enjoy someone playing have a bit of a boogie and go home but because they all close at certain times which leads to most of these clubs booking the biggest people of all time to fill it in because they want to make sure tickets sell it kind of inadvertently pushing you to make every single night out some sort of semblance some sort of something similar or something akin to fucking project x or something do you know what i mean when really it doesn't need to be that most places you go to in the continent are just places you can go to a sit down and have fun listen to music and keep it moving but here in the uk everything is like a big finale everything is like a new year's eve everything's like a halloween like it's just like relax man relax relax and i don't think these sort of thing help i really don't um duh, 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 what are people saying um vice world news global editor said this doesn't look very legal if a police officers ask you to do a drug swap for no reason just refuse definitely agree with that one police organizations have also been quick to s i guess they can just voluntarily ask you to swab you don't have to stop and swab um i don't think the same applies to stop and search right because it's stop and search if they tell you to stop and they think you're, you know, especially if you're a black dude and they think you've got a knife, you have to stop. If you don't stop, 
they're gonna chase you and fucking do you for fucking resisting arrest in it or if then you re if you resist you get done for resisting arrest with a what's the thing with um v v you know grievous bodily harm or whatever it may be called the charges will just start stumping out quickly so um it says here continues and um, whilst i met police waste time swapping people in the propaganda exercise on the behalf of the government many more vulnerable people will continue to die on our streets of course the homelessness problem in the, UK, in the uk especially in london has been going crazy i don't know what happened to everybody in my area who was living in tents in the main kind of city center bit i don't know what happened to them but there's a lot of people they kind of overtook um part of my city center towards what the middle of 2020 and then suddenly they disappeared i don't know where those people are now they're probably not in good shape i'd imagine um again like i said you know there are people still probably living in temporary housing at the time i don't know if council houses are at an all-time low um it's just a bleak time to be alive and this is what they want to spend their time doing these guys are madness um another person called um katya kowalski who's a head strategy of uk organization vault face or mix mag i'm appalled at the recent drug swapping video release of met police this weekend the initiative does nothing to keep the nighttime economy safe as a met claims to, on twitter instead it creates fear hostility between the public drug users and police forces of course and again like everyone keeps saying why don't they do these drug swaps at the house of commons uh you know at number 10 i'm sure they're being for bigger surprises than they do i'm sure this but you know rules for rules for d not for me and you know everyone else gets judged or everyone else gets kind of brought back down to earth and we don't and they don't it's just like i don't know man these people man they're fucking awful 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 human beings we have to just put up with it for the sake of it talking about awful human beings and nightlife culture nightlife industry we have to kind of spread the blame or spread the ha-has or spread the lols or spread the pointing and the ridicule you know evenly right let's give it to everybody and this is one of the topics we have to give it to everybody because this story is absolutely balmy and it? this is courtesy of the guardian it says british dj escapes prosecution after sparking new <laughs> new zealand's first omicron scare if ever there was an indication that djs especially during the pandemic have excessively or i think um grossly overestimated how important they are to society and they've kind of made it their mission to remind people that you know even though we you and i can't work they have to work despite them making 10 times as much as we do on a monthly sometimes on a giggly basis giggly is that make any sense i don't know whatever you know what i mean on a gig basis right these guys make you know 10 grand five grand maybe more um and they're still the ones who are pushing to go and play in all types of places third world countries that are on fire and you know just whatever just bringing their merry band of fucking people twirling their hands in the air wearing fedoras and girls fucking dancing in fucking hula hoops so i mean it's just stupid um but yeah this is quite crazy Robert efridge aka dj dimension apologizes for my misunderstanding and breaking the session rules and visiting auckland venues before testing positive covid honestly what an absolute wild ad it says here a british dj who triggered the new zealand's first omicron scare after breaking the home isolation rule will not be prosecuted for the time being or for his say the ministry of health does not plan to refer to the case of the police the ministry said that in a statement adding that it needs to balance the, the difference so the deterrence effect from any potential prosecution with enabling an environment that does not discourage future ease um, from assisting the public health response or COVID-19 and all that such means. Robert Efridge, known as DJ Dimension, arrived in New Zealand on the 60th of December, spent seven days in one of the country's managed isolation quarantine MIQ facilities where he returned three negative COVID test results. After leaving MIQ, he was required to spend three days in home isolation but did not wait to receive a negative test on day nine, also required before entering the community. So, Again, this just shows the guys are wild, right? Because don't get me wrong, these New Zealand rules and how they're going about things are pretty draconian. They're pretty excessive. But again, that's how they're dealing with stuff. And so far, it's worked for them. It's a bit annoying, but so far, it's worked, right? It's worked to some very degree. But he already done most of it, right? He already stayed in that awful facility that looks a little bit like a gulag, right? But again, it's not. It's pretty comfortable. People seem to be enjoying it. It's not big of an issue. They don't seem to mind. Fair enough. People, you know, if, if people in Australia and New Zealand don't seem to mind it, then let them enjoy themselves, knock themselves out. He does all the hard thing first. And then when it comes to the final bit, you have to spend three days at home again. Imagine the climate in New Zealand. Imagine how lovely it is there. The natural fresh produce that you get to eat, um, fruit, you know, vegetables, whatever, right? So it must be great to be in a country like that where you can fucking eat an absolutely ripe, amazing mango, gigantic avocados, get your mind right, get a bit of vitamin D, just to stay indoors for a couple of days. Not that big of a deal. Three days at max. He doesn't do that. Waits and goes, right? Um, to play what? EDM or whatever his fuck he's playing, right? And somehow that music is whatever... <sighs> 
first of all, he's leaving wherever he lives, right? To travel however many hours it is to go to New Zealand, 16 hours to go and DJ somewhere, right? So clearly he either needs the money or EDM is that important to him that he feels like he has to go and play this gig. Like the fans need to see, need to hear me and see me play this fucking remix or this Tiger record or whatnot, right? Whatever nonsense they're going to play. If that's the case, make sure you're healthy enough to play in front of these people. Why would you just break the quarantine rules and then put the entire community you're going to play in front of that you supposedly love, right? Because these people are the ones I always talk, oh, I love you guys so much, man. You guys are my biggest, you know, those kind of people that give out those empty platitudes because they're getting paid and because they get all the sponsors coming out of their ass. But, you know, it's not necessarily coming from a real place because when it comes to looking after that said community and making sure they're not in any kind of, um, you know, they don't have any kind of... Um, they're not in any kind of danger in terms of catching COVID you don't help them out by just staying indoors and making sure you go through the entire quarantine deal like I said he if he would have broke the first one I would have got it nine day wait in those kind of facilities must be excruciating in regards of how great the weather is in regards of how easy they make it and comfortable or whatnot, it must be hard but that's not what they that's not why he failed he failed on this on at, at the kind of the final hurdle he suddenly decided nah it's not worth it it's like oh my god um where it says da, 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 da. Uh, Etheridge, who had been due to play at the Riven and Alps Festival near the Wanaka last week, apologized to those who have um, inadvertently put at risk as a result of my misunderstanding. I realize the gravity of the situation. I'm deeply regretful of those who have been impactful. No, no, no you didn't. No, you haven't. In an earlier statement, he said, after completing my 10 day isolation and of understanding that I had already completed my quarantine, I entered the community to knock, to shock and the enormous concern. I especially received a positive test on day 12, two days after my isolation period had been ended his case triggered outrage in new zealand has frequently been praised of the pandemic response we've only recently been lifted restrictions in auckland is see a big extent after the delta outbreak despite identifying dozens of close contacts the ministry said on monday that none has so far protested positive virus covid cases are currently trending towards downwards in new zealand with just 27 community cases announced on monday and 24 at the border so i get it right they're an island they have to be a little bit more strict with how they go about things because if not people are going to run through that island and basically set on fire and leave and they're gonna have to pick up all the pieces but again a dj traveling 16 hours or so have a have a thousands of miles that is to go and dj in new zealand and then to decide to break the quarantine rules is just peak business techno you know delusions of grandeur entitlement un you know unwillingness to be self-aware or to kind of like <laughs> operate in a world that like everyone else is operating on that teachers have been going through obviously like i've seen it seems like so far what we've seen we've seen covid has broken the brains of stand-up comedians who generally do think that they're entitled to be able to perform for people despite the world being on fire they did everything in their power to perform if it was in the garage at the top of a car park for them they did, there was no such thing as a time off there was no such thing as a break it didn't exist it was always too long however long it was you got certain people bragging about the fact that they were able to go and tour different places during the pandemic which is fucking crazy to think of because you know most of these people don't you know most of these people most people don't care about what they're doing anyway to, to, for them to expect people to actually care during the pandemic is insane and it's happening with DJs. DJs for some way, of, for some reason, like again, think of all the musicians in the music industry. Think of everyone that works within the music industry who claims a salary, who basically maybe salary is dependent on people going to shows. Think of bands, right? Bands can't play live streams, right? It doesn't necessarily work the same as a DJ. You've got to still get a studio, it's got a lot of money, you've got transport equipment. But DJ can basically travel solo everywhere and plug and play in most places. But for so whatever reason, DJs felt like they had more of a right to claim a career and to rescue it or to fight for it or to play, this, despite the world being on fire, then bans it. And they continue to do so. Some of them decided to move, you know, temporarily to different countries where the rules were a bit more lax, just so they can go and play. I saw people going to fucking Tanzania and shit, like lighting that country up on fire, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, like regardless of what was going any country that was loose and lax with their rules of COVID or had leadership that probably was a little bit anti-vaxxery, all right, they, they suddenly run towards. And most of these guys also, let's say the irony of this, most of them were also vaccinated because of the countries that they were from probably required them to do so but then they went there lit the country on fire let people organize in big groups and just left with no regard but this one is just heinous the lad already completed the hardest part of the fucking isolation just stay in your fucking room play a bit of whatever and then leave do you know what I mean it's not that big of a deal 
but you know the EDM vibes were just calling it was too much for him to stay and then he just continued moving on and you know essentially you know I you know inadvertently he could have led to the deaths of thousands of people <laughs> oh mate just because he went to play press Q and pause on a couple of tunes here and there like these people are absolutely insane man legitimately I think some guy I follow on social media made an article I need to read it basically saying let's end I DJ idolatry and I think I have to agree with the whole with the oh with, with what is kind of titled as do you know what I mean I'm not sure what the contents of the essay is but DJ idolatry definitely needs to end because these fucking guys and girls man like they've been fucking horrible to follow during social media during the pandemic don't get me wrong i didn't follow most of them anyway but just to see hear and see what they're talking about second to third hand has been truly truly embarrassing and extremely cringe to kind of witness um with my bare eyes i'm not going to lie i'm not going to lie um what else we want to talk about here we move on that one that one that one Let's just move here. Let's just talk about this one. End it here between when it comes to the clubs. Um, this is courtesy of RA talking about risky business. It says new venues struggle to ride out pandemic volatility for clubs that open in 2021. The spread of Omicron has brought particularly harsh consequences. I Like I said, I definitely saw that on New Year's Eve. I didn't go out much. Or I didn't go out to a place to go and party. But from where I was able to walk back around and see certain places, it's definitely bleak out there. You know, a lot of the bars and places that you would see that would have people playing, you know, someone playing in a corner somewhere um were fairly empty um i just saw loads of restaurants where people were packed and full but most of the bars and clubs that you would assume would have people dancing in it from the early hours of the evening were fairly fairly empty so i can only imagine what new clubs who just sprung up with no big reputation maybe not no big bookings because again most of the bigger djs who are foreign aren't able to come into the country especially with brexit and stuff i don't know it throws up loads of different issues so i'd imagine it must be one of the most tumultuous times ever it's probably similar to a restaurant too even restaurants i think seem like they've been able to weather the storm more but these sort of venues that clubs are really suffering i think again the idea that clubs are meant to be super spreader locations probably doesn't necessarily help um with people deciding to go and like i mentioned a few times on here i just think in general as a clubbing sort of a community we kind of overlooked and underestimated how much um normally normally yeah normally kind of punters contributed to the overall landscape of the club space right um especially filling out clubs like the people that would go to a club maybe once a month or would pop in after work drinks and whatnot and didn't really care who was playing and just wanted to have a bit of a boogie those people have now basically gone forever it feels like i don't think they're ever going to come back um and obviously that's opened up space because it means now uh, you get more club kids and you get more of a sort of um weirdo freak hell energy on the dance floor which is great because everyone's dancing and having a great time but that normie crowd that would have filled out these smaller places and made them seem more popping than what they actually were they've left the clubs i don't think they're ever coming back and you know djs you know hard to come in the country um there's been never been a culture nowadays nothing in dance music of like pushing or building up younger under discovered or up and coming people to play anyway so now you're having to rely on trying to re you know you're trying to have to rely on people you've never really backed in the first place in an industry and in a scene where people just want to book the biggest names you're going to obviously be led in a kind of tricky position in it but anyway let's continue with this article it says the following it says in the past six months opening of a new club around the world has installed a sense of recovery to the industry brought to its knees by the pandemic the optimism has now soured at the end of oh, sorry at the close of 2020, entrepreneurs preparing to launch nightlife venues had no choice but to patiently postpone their plans. Buoyed by the hope that the vaccine rollers would reignite the entertainment sector, many finally bit the bullet this year. Among the new entrants were Kiev's Arsenal, uh, Arsenal 12. That's a fucking interesting name. Isn't it? Arsenal 22, sorry. Is that what it's called, right? 2 2, yeah, 10 10, yeah. Um, Hanover's, uh, whatever that's spelled, have you pronounced that? Rash in New York, London's Glam Shoreditch, I've never even heard of that. Aiden in Berlin and Toronto Subdivision. Uplifted by the return of the parties and the festival, several owners believed the worst was over as they availed their respective venues. While a lingering sense of caution remained, many felt certain that another lockdown was off the cards. At the time of opening, we were optimistic, said Lena Wee. Lena Wei or Wehi of this place called Wheat. How do you pronounce that? We'd pronounce Wheat Spilio. 
Welt spiel or Welt spiel told President Zavala politicians had promised that um, there wouldn't be another lockdown for a fully vaccinated population. COVID-19 numbers were low and the mask mandates were gone. On the other hand, the team behind subdivisions were extra wary. Though Toronto's nightlife resumed um, this past August with a strict 25% capacity limit, the club scene only opened its doors in November. Um, or the club, sorry, the basement club. I was comfortable being patient if it meant the better chance of getting it right um it didn't i didn't want to rush to open just for the sake of opening said the founder ryan fisher he decided on a two-day week as a way to keep the team small in case of further pandemic related chaos that meant foregoing venue to top of the income lost for the strict capacity rules unfortunately fisher's preventative um measures came into play um, recent emergence of COVID-19 variant Omicron um, has sent another shockwave through the electronic music scene, forcing um, governments to in Italy, Germany and France, the Netherlands, Scotland and parts of Canada, among others, to close clubs. It's a similar situation in Mumbai and Rio de Janeiro, where night curfews um, were in fact. Numerous venues in Lon New York and London, where night levels still open, have also shut or cancelled events out of the caution. Yeah, I saw a lot of events getting cancelled at places like Corsica Studios, which I was flipping shocked by, considering, again, um, how popular that venue is. I saw places like the glove that fits cancelled parties, print works cancelled parties. Like, it's been a brutal, brutal end of year for most clubs, man. Not going to lie. Which obviously explains why a lot of them were empty when I was walking around too. Or the bars and pubs I was around that would look like they'd have DJs in it. It says here continues. It says um, reality has once again caught up with us. Says Ghent. So so again, Spot Funky wrote on Instagram last month announcing its three week closure. The post described the new rules as another slap in the face. And um, Funky was now is now open for just two months before Belgian closed clubs in late November. Jesus. While venues are suffering for across the board, the situation is particularly rough on new businesses. Financial blows aside, the pandemic has crippled the fest to develop the brand identity, secure loyal customer base, and forge relationship with dance music communities. Of course. Canceling bookings for December and January was practically terrible as we're a new club and we're trying to build trust with the artists and agencies. It's not the best way to start a long-term relationship. Um, being unable to confirm 2022 bookings also means this new venue in Berlin or wherever it is um, can't fully showcase uh, musical direction, perspective regulars. The team is very frustrated and there's a lot of internal security. What, where is this actual place that they're talking about? This word, da, 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 da. It's in Hanover. Yeah, I can only imagine, man. Um, when the team when the time to reopen finally comes new venues could find themselves in an even more precarious situation the lack of a reliable crowd as fisher said has a spillover effect it's tough to start out at the emergency talent because priority number one is selling tickets of course it's hard see this is what somebody on the club i told you before man this point oh, man i've been reading this i know this stuff in my bones said it's tough to start out as an emerging talent because priority number one is selling tickets venues have a high rent and finances dictate who they book um if you don't have a following yet you can't sell tickets and that usually means you don't get good gigs definitely true especially the places i've been at right 50 pound gigs and stuff and whatever aren't the greatest but they obviously give you a chance to play but again if you've got a great club you're not going to pay 50 pound guy to play because or girl because they can't sell tickets and it's not going to justify you hiring more security getting more bar stuff and just doesn't make any financial sense and also in general most clubs in europe especially the big ones or big markets they don't have any sort of residency program anyway they don't have any sort of residency um approach to how they put on their events it's all big people playing and then they supplement the warm-up acts with residents who they don't announce so now that the shift is kind of come now where people kind of don't care about the names because they're, they're not coming anyway they just want to go out and support who they don't support you can't then push those guys because you haven't got the infrastructure or the processes or the way of doing it that would push them adequately you know what i mean so some clubs are having to pivot or some clubs are just have to just give up entirely so they've kind of made a road for their own back in some way shape or form but also it's just the industry they were in at the moment it seems like more people again with because they vote with their tickets they vote with their money they vote with their wallets they vote with their feet they prefer to go to places where it's going to be a stacked lineup from top to bottom then go somewhere with emerging acts in most markets not all but most markets so I continue to hear, with the pandemic increasing general expenses and squeezing supply chains net um nascent establishments nascent establishment sorry are also unable to pass on the high operating cost to the customer it says yeah quote as new businesses we're forced to be realistic about where we are in the ecosystem said fisher we need to attract our audience and gain attention we can't price them ourselves out of doing that 
So we have to stay focused on putting in the time and effort into creating a really nice experience for people, even while losing money doing it. It's a nice slow play, an unfortunate one, but that's the hand that we have been dealt with with COVID-19. Adding to the list of worries is the challenge um, of sourcing experienced employees, given the roller coaster ride of regulations over the past two years. Countless nightlife workers across the globe have switched industries. A labor crunch has increased the price of existing personnel. It's really anxious for when we can reopen that there'll be even a smaller pool of workers willing to take the risk of being unemployed again. Bouncers were particularly hard to find when we reopened. We had to get people in from Berlin on the weekends from a different city altogether. And that again shows, man, it's like, of course, it's going to be, part of it's going to be the fact that people are just willing now to claim money for benefits and take government supplies and use the time that they will be working to do the thing they actually enjoy doing, pursuing a side project, you know, pursuing a hobby, whatever it may be. Um, and of course, what they said here is a good point that if you are going to return back into the nightlife industry, every time you keep going back, you run the risk that you might be out of money within the next month because they might turn it off, um, shut down your entire industry and you're unable to kind of pay your way forward in life, which obviously isn't a great way to go about things. So why would you drop what you're currently doing for something that's quite volatile as clubbing is as at the moment? And for whatever reason, the perception of clubbing hasn't changed despite the cases in most places, in most cities around the world, the cases don't spring from clubs, right? They're not the main outbreak, outbreak places as people kind of believe them to be because most of these places, especially the clubs in main city centers, have to confide, have to conform to some sort of health and safety regulations, um, fire regulations, whatever it may be. So usually ventilation in these places isn't an issue. They're usually pretty decent in terms of dealing with it. And for whatever reason, it doesn't need to seem to be the place where people tend to catch COVID bit more um it just isn't because not everyone goes to clubs exactly it's like a small population of people actually go clubbing in the first place so to suggest that they are the the kind of covid and um, hot spots it's just a little bit naive and a little bit short-sighted but again for whatever reason the data people are not necessarily taking a look at it they don't care they're still kind of running this propaganda that the clubs are the enemy to civilization but then they also in some cities, you know, essentially provide jobs for thousands of people. They supply the city itself with masses amounts of money and they don't seem to get the respect that they deserve from the government. It doesn't feel like, you know, so sad to see. Um, as well as being blindsided by new businesses, Omicron has reignited frustrations about government attitudes towards the nighttime economy in the countries where events are legally allowed. Um, attendance has been scarce as officials advise the public to limit social gatherings, which again is harming the clubbing space. Many organisers feel the decision to keep nightlife open places out of the UK and US is simply a means of government to avoid additional payouts. So definitely true. So they kept them open to avoid the payouts, but then they told everyone not to go. <laughs> God, I love it. In the UK, the Nighttime Industry Association, the NTIA, where it's a fuck is emmy lammy that's what i'm asking has one of the industry-wide bankruptcies and absences of more support mechanisms in germany any state aid will likely be paid out um later um says so that that wouldn't even help us to pay salaries right now if public funding vanishes clubs certainly won't survive as they did last year so it's going to be a tricky time for clubs in general i think again if your same rules apply as before if you are going to book tickets to an event Book them knowing that they might get cancelled. Don't be a mug and claim a refund. You've got more disposable income than you'd had previously because you're at home not doing anything. So just, you know, write off the money as a way for you to support the club so they can do what needs to be done in order to keep them lives on, in order to pay people salaries and just do what needs to be done to get to stay in business. So don't claim refunds and try and support them when they are open. You know, be a little bit um, loose with the wallet. Drop a little extra five and maybe for the person that put your cloak, your cloak, sorry, in a cloakroom or let you bring in your cloak or whatever, right? Um, help somebody out around the bar, leave them a tip, do whatever it may be. It needs to be done when they are open to show your appreciation because these places, especially the people that are committed to living and breathing this industry day in, day out, they're, kind of, they're, they're running a really, really tight gamut. Do you know what I mean, um, their lives can be completely upended in a, mo in a moment's notice with little to no regard. They don't really have that much support from the government especially the more time goes on and it's just going to get worse and worse you feel like especially for this hysteria around the variants keeps continuing so it's a bit of a bad one it's a bit of a bad one but yeah what can you do about that what can you do about that quickly switch it up a little bit um we talk about this which makes more sense uh let's talk about this 
talking about dating and stuff and people around this is kind of random information that kind of clicked up my timeline that didn't really make any sense it looks like um kanye's been out on a date with the one julia fox i wonder if it's um he just recently stumbled across um what's it called uh What's it called? Fucking hell. What's that movie called? Something um Uncut Gems, isn't it? Or some movie, right? That she's in there. Everyone kinda got giddy over because they saw her waddling down the street with her massive but dunk a dunk dunk. But maybe he saw that and then kind of put in a good word, but I'm curious to find out how they even know each other. That's definitely something to figure out. That'd be a good story, especially if, if they end up do dating long term. Maybe they could kind of let us know how they ended up actually hooking up in, in that sense in terms of being um familiar. Um funny because I think if I'm not mistaken, a few weeks ago Julie Fox was on social media posting screenshots of her basically blasting her baby daddy and saying how bad of a you know father he was and whatnot. I've done she did it married on I don't know, whatever. Um or maybe they're separated, um, saying that hey run away, deadbeat dad, all this sort of nonsense and then, you know, just the other just and then again a few weeks later she's then now in the arms of Kanye and she does seem a little bit unhinged. I think like great all great actresses and creatives out there, she does seem to have a little bit of an unhinged, crazy side to her, which I think helps with her art. But you you have to kind of um wonder the wisdom if you're Kanye West to kind of stumble out of one relationship where you think you were driven crazy by the family with the Kardashians and Kim and then stumble into the arms of somebody that's clearly going through their own issues with their small family that they're just starting it just doesn't seem like the most comfortable place to be but then you think about it you think to yourself maybe Kanye does enjoy just sitting in a lap of chaos he does enjoy having living his life on the edge somewhat and there is no such thing as a perfect situation in life and you know if somebody comes around that you feel like you're attracted to that you like you kind of ticks all your boxes then why not go with the flow in it let's see what happens um it was just to see what happens if they do date in long time because you know no one sees Julia Fox as like a style icon she looks a bit you know even though she's got a banging bod she does look a bit basic so we just to see if they do end up dating long term if he decides to give her the balenciaga demna makeover or she gets something else going forward and what that ends up looking like because you know kanye has a tendency to want to dress the ladies that he's kind of with which has led people to <laughs> let people to speculate maybe he might just be the gay best friend i don't know but i doubt it but still interesting isn't it very very interesting link up i don't i don't think i would have ever really um seen this happen it's again courtesy of tmz there's pictures of them arriving outside of a restaurant called Carbone in Miami. Miami, he was out there on a real, you know, um, YOLO kind of affair, sitting in the restaurant with his jacket on, ordering food, talking, having a look at her, looking him giddy, right? So, you know, after all the kind of public declarations he made about wanting Kim back, it looks like he's finally given it up because Peter pete davidson i guess is you know piping that down in, in, in the best way possible and now he's kind of let loose and decided to go to miami and party up with french montana and sit around with julia fox having a good time in it so yeah interesting interesting developments um you know again i got nothing more to say about that just in terms of just in development of people walking into chaos from one rock relationship to another again mostly because of the baggage they're coming in with maybe there's some sort of kinship you can kind of find with each other when you're going through a pretty tumultuous time in your life in general but i would love to know how they met each other I really would like what, what what sparked the interest i'm assuming again Kanye, like most guys saw her uncut gems was like whoa who that, who's that googled found out and then maybe put in a good word or maybe Julia Fox has been a fan of him in general. And, you know, these celebrities end up kind of crossing paths in the most random places because there's not a lot of places that they can go and not get bothered. So they tend to kind of uh, flock around the similar sort of places. Maybe, who knows? Um, maybe it's an art thing. Maybe it's a New York thing. I don't know. Um, interesting to see regardless. And, you know, another another one of Kanye's... Uh, interesting kind of affairs in that regard and then moving on from that we've got another bit of news which again i want to just find out more so from the ladies who kind of um listen to the show or maybe people who are more plugged into whatever you know psychology or whatnot or relationships or whatnot. i'm just curious about all this stuff so this is courtesy of tmz it says tristan thomas i had a baby boy with houston woman apologize to Chloe Kardashian um for heartache and humiliation right so I think a few weeks ago, um, some woman came out and basically alleged 
that she had had a baby that was fathered by this guy who's obviously in relationship with Khloe Kardashian who was also involved in that nonsense with Jordan Woods and whatnot and Kylie Jenner I don't know no loads of stuff happened I don't know the intricacies of it but whatever it may be it seemed like you know he publicly embarrassed his girl who happened to be Chloe. she ended up taking him back um people still kind of you know there were still rumors going around that he was still going around creeping doing what he wanted to do he obviously tried to play the family role moved in playing daddy doing all that good stuff and you know things continued and it seemed like things have basically moved on but now this lady comes out of nowhere and says hey this baby's yours and she basically came out with receipts and shared a screenshot of a snapchat conversation that made him look pretty you know pretty awful as a human because he basically was breaking down the laws of different states in terms of what rights she would get in terms of support and whatnot and basically saying it wasn't enough to do with the baby it was just a one night fling she basically argued against it and said they hooked up a few times you know standard protocol with people that are scumbags cool safe whatever um it didn't seem like we got any word from chloe kardashian in terms of what's going on there she hasn't really spoken about it in terms of the issue of come out and said anything again which is quite ironic as well considering how forthright she was about defending this guy because you know depend you know especially when you consider how much of a piece of shit he seems to be like but that aside i'm just wondering in general for the women out there that you know listen to this podcast i'm sure there's not a lot of them that do but for the ones that do what is it about women who want to start families with guys who clearly aren't the best option to start a family with now i'm not saying the guy is not attractive i'm sure women will find him attractive i'm not saying that he you know might not be the best in the sack i'm sure women would love to sleep with a basketball player i'm sure they would but it does seem like whatever from what we know of the Kardashians and especially most of the women in that family they do seem to enjoy having monogamous relationships with men where they can have families with them. They like to purport or to push out this image of them being family women, right? Or being, being mums and maternal figures in some way, shape or form. But they want to be married. They want to be in relationships. They don't like to just be dating random people. They want to be with someone for a long time. So if that's the case, why would you think a guy that clearly has left a trail of broken and you know broken hearts broken women from all around the world right in his wake would be the perfect person to start a family with i don't really understand that and i don't see why again it's not he's just his fault because as piece of shit he is he can only attract what he can attract he can only attract what's attracted to him so there's clearly something about guys like this who clearly aren't the best you know again option for somebody who wants to start a family that stable women again this is mostly a Chloe Kardashian thing which is again I don't understand it at all because you know she's a fairly rich woman on her own even with the without the family's finances um you know probably more famous than him I would assume so too because I'd assume you know no one knew who this guy was before she date before he started dating Chloe in the first place so you'd imagine she doesn't really need for much not really wanting for much so to put yourself in a position where you're basically getting publicly embarrassed by a guy that doesn't necessarily play that much basketball isn't that good isn't that famous is quite embarrassing isn't it it's quite embarrassing and um i just don't know what women see in guys like this i really don't like and, and i think they have to take some responsibility for the situations they get themselves into because i just don't necessarily think a guy like this wakes up and decides to be a dog I think if you're this kind of dude that has different families all over the place and you're impregnating people and running away and shit and you know whatever right all the stuff that you're doing I don't think you just wake up and be that guy you're probably that guy from minute one again it could be family influences trauma I don't know I don't care but in terms of just what he does as a person you don't necessarily do things in isolation they're usually an accumulation of you know numerous different uh, yeah numerous events kind of build up to that kind of event but it's not as if like it just happens in a silo so if that's the case why would you continually go for someone like this it just doesn't make any sense i don't understand it i've never have um i just think it's really really bizarre but i think maybe it's the thing that women have in their head where they think they're going to fix a guy or something i don't know but surely there are better options you can fix surely somebody that's got like financial problems or has got debt or maybe went to a prison for a flipping traffic violation or something that might be someone who could worthy of fixing but a guy that's kind of running wide and loose slamming things with no no condom and basically running away and saying that the keep the if the woman has the kid he's not going to buy support and she would only get 700 dollars or whatever he said in the flipping text not necessarily the best guy in it not necessarily the best dude 
and um yeah the apology was pretty funny itself i think he wrote one here right on his screenshot it said today paternity test <laughs> you really at the end of some hollywood credits and at the end said the paternity test revealed that i fathered a child with marella nichols i take full responsibility it feels like he didn't even write it too i take full responsibility for my actions now that the paternity test has been established i look forward to an amicably raising my son our son sorry i sincerely apologize to everyone i've heard disappointed throughout this ordeal but publicly and put it privately and then the second screenshot he had his name by name it's a chloe with the e on it as well you don't deserve um with your, sorry with your little uh, you know accent on the e you don't deserve this you don't deserve the heartache and humiliation that caused you <laughs> some will say she does but hey um you don't deserve the way that i've treated you over the years my actions certainly have not lined up with the way that i view you and i have utmost respect and love for you regardless of what you may think again i'm so incredibly sorry so who knows maybe he gets taken back still you know i'm assuming women like that are super forgiving so maybe he will none of our business if he does or not but i'm just confused as to why women seem to be again the ones that want to raise families i think if you just want to hook up with a guy like this and you want the clout and you want the money in the bags i get it cool run run riot and do your thing but if you legitimately want to raise a family doing it with somebody that clearly doesn't isn't like you know the best you know option for that and doesn't necessarily know what loyalty means doesn't necessarily know what holding it down means doesn't necessarily mean what sanctity i don't know all these things that you would assume would be tied into one a relationship with somebody i just don't get it i really really don't but you know maybe there's more to it than meets the eye i guess that's the lady herself marily nichols oh yeah that's the text right that he wrote to her supposedly from snapchat or something says tt you know how i feel my feelings haven't changed at all won't be involved at all he says by the way if you think i'm having this baby it's going to make you some money it's completely wrong you are aware that i am retiring after the season so in terms of support it'll be whatever's required monthly for someone who's unemployed this texas so it'll be only a couple hundred dollars so he knows someone said he knows the state by state laws <laughs> so you better off taking this 75k i'm offering you because you won't get nothing near what i'm having the kid with a father who's unemployed all you will have is a baby with a father who has zero involvement with a child and a few hundred dollars to a child support month there is an interesting question that needs to be raised about how much say so a guy does have in terms of not wanting to have a kid with somebody he doesn't want to have a kid with right because when you want to have a raise a family part of the reason how you do it you know biologically is that you make sure you don't wear a condom right you make sure you ejaculate inside a person or you both agree that you're going to you know you're not going to pull out cool whatever or she's not going to be a birth control but you're still both deciding right and if it does happen that the person's pregnant they have to come to you and not they have to they have to come to you but they tell you right they would usually inform you hey this happened and then maybe you sit down and you make some sort of decision based on what the information you have available um you'd think so but when it comes to this point and one person says I want to have it, one person doesn't, how much sway so does the other person have, especially if they're not the woman? Like how much say do you really do have in this situation? You probably have zelch in the reality of things because if the woman decides to run away and have the kid, there's literally nothing you can do physically and legally to stop them having it. But in terms of in terms of um, ethics and morally and whatever it may be, if there is love or lust there and you are hooking up regularly, and you are having a good time and just hanging out it's a little bit out of order to expect that person to be okay with you having their kid under the guise that we're going to raise a family if you are only meeting up to bang you're only meeting up in hotel rooms only meeting up in miami las vegas to go to a strip club and to hang out to suddenly feel that that person's going to be okay with you being in a relationship and having an actual baby with them is a bit dumb do you know what i mean maybe maybe it is maybe it isn't um but I think nowadays for a guy to sit there and have the gumption and the guts and the nerve to tell a woman that I don't want to have a kid and you have to listen to what I have to say, oof, that's going to be a brave dude. And again, they're just not going to listen to you, especially if they made their mind up, right? You're just not going to have a say so because it's their body. They're the one having to carry the kid for nine months and push you out of their flipping JJ. You have no right to say anything, but I don't know, man. It's part of me that thinks a little bit like if you are just hooking up and it's just a flipping hookup session and it's not, because again, it may be different. She might come out and say, no, he actually gave me the illusion or he lied and said he was going to leave her for me and we're going to start a family. Okay, cool. Then he has no leg to stand on. But if it was always kind of known that they were always just going to be strictly a hookup thing and it wasn't going to be more than that and now suddenly you get pregnant and you see it as an opportunity to catch a lick i don't know man i don't think that's fair but again the game is a game though the game is also the game if, you, if they do catch a lick and you put yourself in that position 
he didn't wear protection and it is what it is but I still think there needs to be some fairness in how those things are dealt with but try and argue that point I dare you try and argue that point <laughs> try and debate with a woman that you know if they feel pregnant that you have that if they feel pregnant or if they are pregnant that they you have just as much just as much right to tell them to terminate the pregnancy as they do as they do to keep it i bet i dare you to do that and i dare you to get a response that you like <laughs> it's never gonna happen man but you know what can you do what can you do i'm sure they'll handle it rich people get into rich you might rich people probably do more ratchet things than people that are broken it it's interesting right all that money all that time all those resources and they still get themselves in positions where they have to you know public statements like that look trashy online it's just come on man you're rich you should be a little bit more comfortable a little bit more relaxed a little bit less you know whatever you should in it you should in theory but hey in theory is one thing in real life is another thing it is what it is but yeah that's the next thing show episode number 535 thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual if it's your first time checking out the show via youtube you know what to do smash like it subscribe leave me a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app of course leave me a rating whatever you want to do that would be greatly appreciated and of course support via patrons welcome to at patreon.com for just agostino there's going to be new shows coming out at the end of the week so keep an eye out for that one and i'll see you guys again very soon until then take care peace